Welcome, welcome to the Mysterious Book Emporium. Last time, Prince Merrick had just reunited with his rebel camp as the Orlesian army approaches with certain doom. Bougain had promised a plan to stop from losing the entire army, but will it work? Why don't you take a seat as we continue on with part two of The Stolen Throne, chapters five through eight. Chapter five. We open this chapter seeing what Loghain's plan was. Loghain figures that the Orlesians expected the rebel camp to take the important forces to protect the prince and flee, leaving behind the weaker and unorganized group, which was their plan to begin with. Loghain then suggests that they send out a decoy prince with a token force out to bait the Orlesians, and then leave the majority of the rebel army to fight the oncoming forces. This would leave the Orlesian forces split in half, one chasing the decoy prince and the other fighting the rebel army. This would give the rebel army a strong chance to win the battle, but means a suicide mission for the decoy prince and the token force. And so Loghain volunteers to be the decoy prince, wearing the purple cloak of the rebel queen. Him and a few other knights go off and act like the prince and his men. Sure enough, they are spotted by Orlesian forces who chases after Loghain. He leads them up to a narrow cliff face that is easily defendable, and together they fight their lives against the oncoming Orlesian forces who believe they have the prince in sight. They wait for a backup rescue from the rebel army that Loghain believes won't come because the main army needs all the men they can get. We jump back to Merrick and Rowan with the main rebel forces. Merrick is fighting in the battle, although not as close to the front as he would like. Rowan is waiting with her horsemen to charge in when Merrick's position is beginning to get overwhelmed. It seems Loghain's plan is working, as the Orlesian forces that attack the rebel army are surprised at how well organized they are. We see Wilhelm the Mage and his Gollum taking out a large amount of forces. However, despite this surprise, the Orlesians end up having way more men than previously thought. But as Rowan watches the fight, she begins to worry about Loghain. She leaves behind her lieutenant, Branwen, in charge of her force and races to find her father. When she finds him, she asks to go and rescue Loghain. The Earl explains that she is needed at this battle and that Loghain is expendable. This angers Rowan as they promise to try and rescue him. She returns to her troops and seeing that Merrick is doing fine on his own, disobeys her father's orders and goes after Loghain with her men. When asked what about the prince, she replies, the maker will watch over him. We jump back to Loghain with not many men left alive in the troop. Loghain is resentful for the rebel army until he hears a horn sound. The rescue is coming. Because most of the Orlesian troops are on foot, they are surprised when a large group of soldiers on horseback flank them, basically running over a large amount of men. Rowan even manages to cut down a major general in the Orlesian army. Many of the Orlesian soldiers flee, and Rowan saves Loghain and the remaining knights, taking them back to camp. Loghain shakes Rowan's hands and thanks her for the impressive charge she and her men did. Rowan is surprised and their eyes linger for just a moment before she compliments Loghain's ability to hold fur on so many men. The two and their forces then rejoin the bulk of the army. We then cut to Merrick fighting in the battle. Although injured, he is holding his own against the forces, but it seems he is mostly alive thanks to blind luck. At one point, Merrick is trapped on the ground about to be killed by a man with a large axe. And just before the killing blow, a random gauntlet that is flung from an unknown source hits the attacker in the head, delaying him just long enough for Merrick to roll out of the way, and Wilhelm is then able to strike a hole through the attacker's chest. Merrick wonders how Loghain is holding up, and he's worried about his friend. Then the Orlesians finally call for a retreat. Arendorn calls for the rebels to retreat as well. While this is not a victory for either side, as both suffered heavy losses, and while the rebel army lost many needed supplies, they didn't lose everything like they thought they were, and it was something to celebrate. Merrick, Loghain, and Rowan reunite, sharing stories, and glad to see each other alive. Arendorn also confronts his daughter for disobeying orders. As it end up being a good call, it's hard to stay angry, and the four focus on what needs to be done for the remaining army. At the end, Loghain is asked to officially join the rebel army, and after Rowan and Merrick brag about his abilities, he accepts. Merrick thinking that this is the first time he actually saw his friend smile. Loghain also learns that Merrick and Rowan are betrothed. Later that night, Merrick slips away to take a breather. He makes his way to an older man who seemed to lost his leg in the battle. Merrick apologizes for the injury, but the man weighs his worries away. He tells Merrick that he saw him fight in the battle and how proud he was to see it. He tells Merrick that he believes the Maker sent him to the rebels to protect them. The two cheer to the late queen, and Merrick thinks that perhaps leading an army wasn't so impossible after all. Chapter 6 
we switch to something completely new. Denerim and the birthday celebrations of the Elysian king of Ferelden, Megrin. We follow a mage named Severin who thinks on how the king Megrin came to rule Ferelden. Rumor has it that the current king was sent to Ferelden only after angering the Orlesian Emperor, his first cousin, and rumored lover. Even Severin, who is aligned with the Orlesians, although he was not from Orle or Ferelden, knows that the king is a tyrant and the noble celebrating now is only doing so out of fear. We see the Arl of Amaranthine present the king with a sword of Dorvan make. After some probing by King Megrin, the Arl informs him that the sword has been in his family for generations. The king then begins to play with the Arl, asking him why he would present a sword that isn't made for him. The emperor sent him a custom-made sword. Does he think he's better than the emperor? This scares the Arl, thinking that he is about to be killed. The Grand Cleric of Ferelden, Mother Bronark, steps in, suggesting that Perhaps the Arl should donate the sword to the Chantry as a gift in the king's name. The Arl agrees, and the king laughs at the Arl's obvious nervousness. We learn that Severin is an advisor to Megrin and asks to talk to him privately. Severin, King Megrin, and Mother Bronart gather together in a side room, and the king complains about how terrible Ferelden is the entire time. This is a man used to ultimate luxury, and Ferelden has basics at best. Severin reports to the king that he is a message from the Emperor. There is currently no room in the court for him at the moment, which Megrin sighs and says that the Emperor has not forgiven him yet. Severin quips back that he is unsure why the king expected a different outcome, as this is the 14th letter he has gotten back, calling him a bit insane, which amuses Megrin and upsets the mother. Severin also informs the king that Prince Merrick has somehow survived and the battle has only inspired the rebels rather than depressed them. This upsets the king and is surprised that what they thought was an incompetent prince was able to, in escape an assassination attempt, make his way back to his forces just in time to lead an army. Severin and the mother argue for a bit, her angry that a maid should be allowed so high a position, but Megrin shuts her down. Mother Bronark then begs the king to try and gain the respect of the Ferelden people by marrying a woman from one of the noble families. Megrin denies this, saying that they will accept them because they have no choice. Megrin gives Severin another chance to come up with another plan to stop the growing rebels. As Severin leaves, he is thankful that he doesn't have to return to the Circle of Magi, where he would be under constant watch. In his room, he finds an elven woman with bright blonde hair and impossibly green eyes, a bard he had sent for. He threatens her to succeed in her task, or he will ruin her and toss her into the alienage. Her task is to get close to the prince, and if she does so, she can have anything she wishes. She leaves overhearing screams of pain coming from the celebrations down below. Chapter 7 This chapter is basically a summary of events that happens over a few years, so prepare for a summary of a summary. After the battle, it was hard to regain men and supplies. To make up for what they had lost, they needed scouts. So the gang gathered a group of elves, as they were able to see better in the dark, and the group go out scouting missions in the dead of night. This group would gain the name, the Night Elves. Along with the scouting, the Night Elves would also target the enemies and make quick strikes by night, with Rowan's horsemen attacking by day. While losses were had on both sides during this time, the Orlesians were slowly backing away from the rebels, giving them a chance to wander and hide in rural Ferelden. Eventually, the rebel army settles near southern shore of Lake Kalanhad. Loghain is made an official lieutenant and his company of elves an actual unit. Still on the move, they find themselves near Amaranthine and Arl Byron ignores their presence there. During their time there, Rowan and Loghain set out to recruit more help from local Ferelden's, traveling around and spreading word that the rebellion is still going strong. During the months they spent together, they both come close to being captured, saving each other many times. It's obvious that in these months they spent traveling together, there was something growing between them. Meanwhile, Merrick was also traveling. He went to visit the mages to see if any could be recruited. Although they held firm on their stance of neutrality, although they were looking the other way that Wilhelm was in the rebel camp, the mages nervously informed Merrick that Mother Bronark was also visiting the Circle, although she had left her honor guard in Denrum. After some convincing, Merrick is able to arrange a meeting with Mother Bronark, and the two stand off alone in the meeting hall of the Circle Tower. Merrick bows and kindly asks for the Mother's reconsideration in support of what is best for Ferelden, its true king who isn't a tyrant. Mother Bronark yells back that Merrick is the violent one, choosing to wage wars instead of bowing to the Maker's chosen king. This outrages Merrick, who storms up face to face with the Mother, 
but the two part ways with the Chantry still on the side of the Orlesians. Eventually, our trio of Merrick, Rowan, and Loghain meet back up in Amaranthine with the rest of the Rebels. Merrick has grown a beard, and the Rebels receive a message from the Arl of Amaranthine. The Orlesians are on their way. While the rest of the camp heads out, Merrick and Loghain go visit Arl Brian. He thanks the Arl for the message and wishes that no ill will will come upon him from helping the Rebels. On the way out of Amaranthine, Merrick is stopped by Arl Bryran and his men. He tells him that he wishes to join the Rebels. Two years pass now, and the Rebels are still rebuilding. The Night Elves take heavy losses in a battle. Merrick is upset that his plans aren't taken seriously. Rowan is angered by Merrick's stupidity. Merrick and Loghain get closer as Loghain teaches him how to fight. And Rowan and Loghain duel in front of most of the army for almost an hour, with Loghain just barely winning. But most importantly, three years after the death of Queen Moira, they have gathered enough of an army to do something. They choose to advance on Guerin, a city of fishermen and loggers, a town that would be fairly defensible. Al Byron takes a fair amount of men to act as decoys for the Legion army while they capture the city. The rebel army advances on the town, and despite best efforts not to ruin it or harm innocents, fires begin to spread and some houses are ruined. Merrick fears that the town will think of him as the villain that King Megrin claims he is. After the town is mostly captured, Rowan and Merrick hear a woman screaming. Merrick rushes to her aid, and he finds a woman being clawed at by a group of men who don't seem to be from the area. Rowan and Merrick save her, and she thanks them both. Merrick is smitten by how beautiful she is, an elven woman with impossibly green eyes and bright blonde curls. She identifies herself as Catriel, and she is a messenger from Arl Byron. The Arl has been defeated, and the Elysian army is on their way, perhaps a day from closing in on the town. The Rebels are trapped. Chapter 8 The chapter opens up with Loghain hiding in an abandoned shop as he reflects on what has happened for the past 24 hours or so. The rain had stopped the fires from burning down the whole town, and he had been carrying out a raid of the manor of Guerin when Rowan and Merrick frantically rode up to him to explain the message they have just received. Loghain thought it was odd that the Arl didn't ride out to give the message himself and send this small elven woman to do the job, but considering that Merrick would probably do the same given the chance, he isn't that suspicious. The current plan of attack was to hide the army in houses and let the Orlesians troop walk in as far in the city as possible, then attack. Despite the destruction, locals of the towns were cooperative and even wanting to help. They see Merrick as a figure who will save them from the Orlesians. A mage who I will spoil is described to look and act like Severin, but isn't, leads the army in towards the center of the city and is approached by a few pitiful looking survivors of the rebel attack. We learn that most were actually real citizens of Guerin that wish to help the rebels, but one is Rowan, disguised as a peasant. Both Loghain and Merrick were surprised to see her in a dress, as well as uncomfortable to send her out towards the enemy without weapons and armor. The group of peasants and Rowan claim that the rebel army had left the day before on great ships from a land they didn't know, describing the flags to be similar to that of Antiva. The mage slaps Rowan for lying, but the group backs up her tail. He then uses magic to immobilize Rowan and begins to fondle her when an arrow strikes him right in the chest, with Merrick giving the call to charge. Loghain is frustrated as it was a bit too soon, but goes in to help Rowan. Merrick tosses her a blade, and the first thing she does is sink it deep into the mage's chest, killing him. After a bit of fighting happens and Merrick is heavily wounded, he blacks out and Rowan and Loghain drag him back to the Guerin Manor. We then cut to Merrick waking up hours later and well after the battle. He had almost bled to death, but survived thanks to his friends. Al Rendorn informs Merrick that while they did not kill as many of the Orlesian forces as they wanted, they didn't fend off the army. So for the moment, the rebels owned the city of Guerin. Late into the night, Merrick awakens to find a female figure coming to him. Confused, he calls out for Rowan, but finds out it's actually Catriel. They talk a bit, with Catriel being genuinely surprised that he remembers her name and is treating her with respect. He calls her beautiful, and then she begins the subtle bard charm that Liliana talks about in Dragon Age Origins. When she leans into him, he expresses concern that he doesn't want her to feel obligated. The two share a kiss in the dim light, and we cut to Rowan, standing outside the tent, having accidentally overheard the entire conversation. She wears the only nice dress she owns, a fancy red and teven gown that a woman told her she was too muscular to wear, and so she bought it in spite. She leaves as she begins to hear moans. 
Rowan reflects on what happened, that she shouldn't have come to Merrick, that the dress she wears was stupid, and she accidentally runs into Loghain. Loghain questions her about the dress, curious as to why she would wander around in the middle of the night with it on, and Rowan is silent, to which Loghain tells her that she looks beautiful. Rowan protests him to please not do what he is about to, and Loghain replies that he knows she has feelings for Merrick and that she will be his queen, but for the past three years he has had no other thoughts but of her. Rowan pulls away from him, angry and upset, begging him not to say these things. Loghain is stricken, and Rowan declares that she cannot be that woman, the woman that cheats on her betrothed. She fled from Loghain, not looking back. Discussion. Before I begin really anything, I just want to address an error from last week's episode, well, two weeks episode. Yash on YouTube said, The Rebel Queen's name is Moira, not Moria, and unless I misheard you consistently refer to her as the latter, if I did mishear, you can safely ignore this. No, I was saying Moria because I honestly thought it was Moria. I just read it wrong, and that's just what my brain said the entire time. So from now on, and hopefully forever in the future, we will refer to her as Moira, not Moria. This week, a huge thank you to the wonderfully talented Cyrilda, I think is how it's pronounced. She did a fantastic job, and this is basically just how I imagined the scene, so it was really great to find this wonderful image in my inbox. So thank you so, so, so much. Now moving on to the actual discussion, Rowan's lieutenant calls Wilhelm a wizard. This isn't anything too exciting, but rarely in Dragon Age is that word used. Usually it's just mage. We see the word witch thrown around from time to time, but it's usually as a derogatory term to female mages, or even to denote a female mage that should be feared. The usage of wizard here seems a lot more benign, so it's interesting to see the gender differences is what is basically the same word. Yash also brings up why Wilhelm would wear bright yellow mage robes to a battle. My knee-jerk reaction was, why would he still wear this? But it makes some sense. I doubt Wilhelm had much contact with the Circle in his years with the Rebels, the exception being the events a bit later in the book. He probably considers himself on thin ice, given the Ferelden Circle was doing its best to stay neutral and didn't want to push his luck by changing out of the customary attire, since they might brand him as an apostate. We have another Flukus classic of depicting unusual pronunciations. This one brings out my American pride. The narrator pronounced the word lieutenant as Lieutenant. As such, I was inspired to draw Rowan and Branwen in the style of South Park and the comic strip. I do love a bit of good humor on trashing the differences of American and British English pronunciation. Which, by the way, it's aluminum, not aluminium. And speaking of the audiobook, Yash also points out that amaranthine is pronounced more like amaranthine. Yash then goes on to say, I wonder if the map of Railden was ever changed during development, as after the battle, the rebel army retreats into the foothills of the Frostback Mountains, then they go north to the area around Redcliffe, and eventually wind up in Amaranthine in the northeast. That's quite the journey, and through the Bryn Norn, which is mostly farmland, so it doesn't have a lot of cover for an army. And I wouldn't be surprised if they did. At the very least, the map at the start of the book is slightly different from the in-game version, and Antiva is called by a weird name, which I'll get to in a bit. Now I'd like to go on a small discussion about the Arl of Amaranthine. So we know that the rulers of Amaranthine are the Howe family, and that Tarleton Howe, the father of Rendon Howe, the one that we know and hate, sided with the Orlesians. But this Arl isn't Tarleton Howe, this is Byron Howe, who we later see join the rebel army. So then it seems that Byron was the proper Arl of Amaranthine, and that his brother Tarleton perhaps took over and sided with the Orlesians after Byron left? Along with all of this, I wonder if the battle that Arl Byron loses in Chapter 7 is the Battle of Harper's Sword, mentioned in the World of Thetis as the place where Bryce Kuslin and Rendon Howe would become friends after being one of the few who survived. This is completely guesswork, however, so just my theory of the day. Which, a quick side note, uh, another correction from last week is that I had a submission from Anna, except I pronounced her name wrong and it's Anana, so sorry about that. Anyway, she mentions again that she is suspicious that Arl Byron was a part of the Cathariel scheme to begin with, and it might be the case, but I just have my doubts. At the very least, World of Thetis paints Byron as someone who was an earnest in joining the rebels, although so was another how that joined the cause. I don't think this is a bad theory, I think it's actually very plausible, it's just I want to believe that there's two good hows out in the world. 
This is a small bit that I mostly glossed over, but at one point, Merrick is deeply upset that he seems to be not taken seriously in his position in the army. And he even spends a week completely drunk and depressed before Loghain found him and chewed him out about it. I think this is a fun detail because this is exactly what Alistair does if you recruit Loghain into the Wardens and Origins, and both are around the same age when they become a drunk. I also want to talk about Severin. It's hard to express this in the summary, but if you read the book, you hate this guy. Here's just a little excerpt that gets the point across well enough. The finest compliment Severin had ever received was from a young prostitute who had said he looked clever, that his tiny eyes could seize her, chew her up, and spit her out, all with a single gaze. He had liked that so much, he waited until morning to have her dragged off to prison. Anana also asks the question of where Severn is from. The novel just describes him as having dark skin and coming from the north, but I can't remember if it's actually stated later on in the book or somewhere else. But the DA Wiggy does state that he's from Ravane. I'm not sure if it's just later in the novel and I've completely forgotten about it, or if it was tweeted about in some strange place an eon ago, I have no idea. Let's jump to the fake ships that the rebel army supposedly left on. I'm not sure if this is the case in newer copies, but at least in my copy of the book, it says the ships were described as being from Calabria. This probably confused many of you because there is no Calabria in Thetis. At least there isn't now. What happened is that Calabria was the original name for Antiva. In very early copies of Dragon Age Media, you can actually still see the name Calabria floating about. I've also read that some translations of Dragon Age Origins use Calabria when they mean Ativa, but as I only play in English, I don't know if that's true or not. I've read that they changed it because Calabria is a real town and they didn't want to confuse the two, but who really knows? Uh, from this segment, we also learned that the symbol of Antiva is two golden drakes, which are male dragons, and I don't think we've ever seen this depicted or even talked about before, but I might be wrong. It's been a while. And at the very end, we have the beginning of what I like to call the Stolen Throne Square. For the confused, here is a small diagram I've whipped up. As for a very quick summary of how things are currently looking, Merrick is betrothed to Rowan, but seems to see her as an eventual partner rather than a current one. He is best friends with Loghain and currently sleeping with Catriel. Rowan wants to be honorable and save herself from Merrick, but denies feelings for Loghain. Loghain has obvious feelings for Rowan, and Catriel is a bard for the Elysian sent to spy on Merrick. It isn't Dragon Age unless there are romances and stories of human interactions, right? For the rest of the novel, this square in the war will be the focus, so we will probably be updating this as time goes on. And I also want to highlight a PM I got from Allie the Randomizer. Rowan really stood out to me for these chapters. Her unwavering loyalty to Merrick speaks volumes, especially considering Catriel and Loghain are not making it very easy for her. She is incredibly brave and her snarky nature has made me laugh more than a few times. I respect Rowan as a character much more than I thought I would when she was introduced earlier on, and despite how this section of chapters ends off with the relationship, I admire how Rowan and Loghain have similar mindsets in regards to strategy and as well as the fact they grow to trust one another as well as care for Merrick in their own ways. I completely agree with Allie here, and it's a shame we never get to see Rowan in any other form because she is great. Doing summaries really sucks out the characterization from the novel, but you really just feel for Rowan in that last bit in Chapter 8. While Merrick is described as being the one to lead the people and capture their hearts, Rowan has captured mine. Anna also brings up two really good critiques to the novel. One, that the book would probably read a lot better if you had no idea what the story was in Dragon Age Origins. For example, we know they're going to win the war. We know they're going to win the battles. We know Merrick's always going to survive and he's going to marry Rowan. We know these things are always going to happen. She also says that in chapter 6, when it's revealed Catriel is a bard, it sort of ruins the tension later on in the book. And yeah, I agree with her. I think it'd be really fun to just experience Dragon Age from all of the media in chronological order. That way things wouldn't be ruined. And that the chapter 6 reveal could have been probably handled a little bit better. Um, but it, in, in a weird way, it almost seems that this is a theme with Dragon Age series. Like, I'd like to point out Zevran and the Solus epilogue in Inquisition. Like, can you imagine playing Trespasser having not watched that epilogue? It would have been a lot cooler. It just seems that Dragon Age is so excited to tell you the plot twist sometimes that it just spills the beans a little early. I have some more thoughts on this, but I think it'd be best saved towards the end of the novel. So keep a tab on this idea, and we'll talk about it when we go over the epilogue in a couple of weeks.
And with that, thank you to everyone who submitted entries. I look forward to what everyone comes up with next time. Our next section will consist of chapters 9 through 12. And please send me your comments, artwork, videos, literally anything by April 22nd, 2018. Either comment below, send me an email at gildrathon at gmail.com, tweet at gildrathon on Twitter, or PM user Gillanon on Reddit. Dress your all.